So the weather forecast for this week was pretty bleak, and the weatherman nailed it. It, it was bleak weather, um, so no boat work has happened. So I thought I would post this video of some bronze work we did this week. Um, I have lots of videos of of this type of work back um, if you look back a couple of years on my, on my channel. But uh, we did one this week. I didn't film the mold making, but I did film from having a mold forward. So the first step in my um, wax removal, the way I do it, I'm going to have to grind all the extra ceramic shell to get a clean wax surface. This is a big solid wax cup and then heat the cup to get it out, melt it, and get the hook out. Um, but then I'm going to put it in the kiln and melt out the rest of the wax. But i got to put my foundry back together. I've got everything all shoved over here because I was working on the T-top. But now we got to get back in foundry mode, so we got to move some stuff around. I usually do this outside, but it's raining. Melted wax sticks to everything under the sun except for water. So when I'm melting wax, trying to remove it from something, I just do it over a pan of water and it falls in the water, it chills, and I can pick it up later and I always reuse my wax. I'm going to melt all of the wax out in the kiln, um, but there's a problem. When wax gets hot, it expands and it will crack this mold um, if it's allowed to expand or if it expands too much. And this big pour cup is a big hunk of wax and it would melt the last. It would be the last thing to melt before everything else melts. So it would kind of act like a dam and cause problems. So I'm melting the cup out um, manually with a torch and getting it out so that the rest of the wax can flow as soon as it gets warm and not expand and crack the mold. pieces in the kiln and with the flames on and the bottom open you see I got the bottom door open and the grating is uh, open uh, we'll melt the rest of the wax out and the wax will drip again into the water so I can save it and reuse it like this wax now it's real dirty I have to melt it and strain it but it's still usable otherwise it's all going to burn and um, make huge clouds of smoke which we don't need so try to save it We're at 840 degrees. That's about as hot as I can get it with the bottom open. And the wax is coming out. Still got a ways to go. We'll uh, keep the heat on until no more wax drips and no more little pieces of fire up here. That's the wax burning. Until all the wax is out. Okay, I'm up to 900 degrees almost. Uh, no more wax is dripping, but I need to get the shell to about 1600 degrees to vitrify it to make it strong enough to accept molten bronze without cracking. And I can't with the bottom door open because there's just too much air going in there. Now it would be nice if I could just shut the bottom door and bring up the temperature. But what's going to happen is the metal grate that the uh, ceramic shell is standing on it's going to warp badly. It just can't take that heat. So what I got to do is turn off the furnace, let it cool down a little bit, take the mold out, put some insulation over the bars, and then bring the heat back up. So uh, I'm going to turn it off now, let it cool down a little bit just so I can handle a piece. And uh, I'll show you what I mean in a second. Okay, so it's cooled down to 300 degrees. This is a little more comfortable to handle. We're going to open it up, take the mold out, and put some insulation board down and then put it back and then bring the heat up higher. I wasn't planning on making this video until I saw the weather report. Um, so I don't have any video of making the mold, but I have lots of foundry videos. If you go look at my videos and go back a couple of years, um, there's plenty of them. All the um, wax work is more or less the same. This one's just a little on the big side for for us, it's about as big as I can handle in the um, shell room. Okay, 
So I want to show you that the mold is not perfectly clean. It still has carbon deposits and maybe a little bit of wax. And if you were to pour bronze in it like it is, you'd have like a steam explosion. It would be awful because uh, bronze is so hot it would react to all that carbon and junk. So we're going to uh, fire it. It'll be clean white when it comes out of the kiln. So instead of turning all this wax into smoke, um, I, I'll reuse it. I'll reuse every bit of it. We've been cooking at just under 1700 degrees for, uh, I don't know, 40 minutes or so. Pretty hot in there. I'm going to call it good, turn it off, let it cool down, and then we'll take a peek. So the kiln has cooled down to 500 degrees. Let's take a peek and make sure it's all white. let it cool down I'm gonna wash it out with water to make sure there's no crap in it and I'm gonna put it in the sand pit and make sure it'll stand up straight and then um, right before we pour the bronze we're gonna heat it up again because we don't want to pour hot bronze in a cold mold we're gonna get the mold hot again but uh, it's vitrified now so now if you put it out in the rain it won't melt because it's basically a piece of porcelain before I fired it if you put it out in the rain it would have just disintegrated because it wasn't vitrified yet. So pretty cool stuff. So I just rinsed it out with water and no leaks, which is always a good thing. And I wanted to show you, this is where there was the wax cup. And this square was where there was a wax sprue. So off of that main sprue, I have a bunch of feeders that feed the bronze. Um, you can't just pour from the top, like without all this stuff because the bronze would freeze before it filled all the cavities. So you gotta have something big for the bronze to go down fast before it cools. And what I try to do is get the bronze to the bottom as quickly as possible and let it fill going up. So that's why I'll have all my feeders sloping backwards. Um, so I've just lit the um, furnace. The crucible's sitting in the furnace and it's full of bronze. I got one new 25 pound ingot and the rest is just scrapped it's in there as much as i can get and we're getting ready to close the top and turn on the blower and make some heat so right now the flame is all on the outside of the furnace because there's no air in the furnace so this is doing us no good at all so i need to turn on the blower and put some air inside the furnace and then the flame will jump down so now the flame's in the furnace i kick I keep it kind of low because I want to um, dry the furnace out for a little while before we turn up the gas and turn up the air. I don't want it to crack. So now the furnace has been on for a little while and um, it's still pumping out steam. See that's not smoke, that's moisture being burned off of the furnace. I don't know how it gets on there. The thing is inside, it's never been in the rain, but it takes a while for it to dry out when you light it up. And I have a bunch of scrap bronze from a previous pour sitting on top. It's uh, preheating, so I don't waste that heat coming out the top. And it's also drying, so I don't, want, I don't ever want to put it, anything damp into the crucible. That'd be bad stuff. So this is maximum temperature. Um, no more yellow flame, no more orange flame. It's just white on the inside. And most of the bronze has been put in the crucible. As it melts down, I'll put the rest of this in there. I can I scoop off the impurities from the top and put them in this little waste basket. The crucible is full, the bronze is up to about 2200 degrees. I have a little infrared gun that I can shoot it with. So I'm going to turn the flame down a little bit so it doesn't overheat. And we're going to go get the mold, put it in the sand pit, get the bronze, uh, and pour it. So the oven is 1700 degrees. It melts my face shield when I first open the door. Um, I grab the mold and it's not fragile but it is breakable so I gotta kind of pick it up gingerly and I put it on this little table which has some ceramic fiber um, insulation on it so the table doesn't burn up and my wife here is acting like a catcher because sometimes it's hard to get the tongs out from under the piece 
So then we're going to roll the um, hot mold around to the sand pit. It's not very far, 10 to 12 feet. And I pick up the mold with the mitts I've made, which, which is uh, welding gloves with this ceramic fiber wire to the front. Protects you from heat. You don't feel any heat at all, but they're kind of awkward because they're more like paddles than mitts. And set the mold in the sand pit. Um, if you spill molten bronze on the concrete, the concrete will pop and you'll get little hot BBs flying around the room. If you spill molten bronze in sand, absolutely nothing happens. So we always pour in the sand. So then I'm getting turned off the furnace and I'm scraping a little bit more junk that was in the top of the bronze. Um, when you melt a lot of scrap, they got a lot of dirt on it and they got little pieces of old ceramic shell from the last pour, you end up with a lot of dross on the top. And with the blower off and with the flame off, the flame makes a lot of noise. Sounds like a little jet engine. Um, gets kind of eerily quiet in a room all of a sudden. Uh, that's a good thing you can concentrate a little more and concentrate on what you're doing. So I'm cleaning the metal. So it's time to get the crucible out of the furnace. Um, we have an electric hoist. Debbie operates the hoist. Um, I can do it myself and pour by myself, but it is kind of awkward trying to handle the uh, tongs and operate the crane at the same time. So she likes to do it. And she refers to it as doing the buttons. She is doing the buttons. And uh, so we reach in, grab the crucible, uh, tighten up the tongs, and put in a safety pin. Uh, crucible holds 90 pounds of bronze. The crucible probably weighs about 40 pounds. And the tongs probably weigh another 40, maybe. So, um, you know, plenty of foundries just pick this up by hand if you got two guys, but if if you're by yourself, you really can't do it by hand. So we uh, communicate pretty well, get the um, crucible in position so I can pour and try not to spill it all over the place. I did pretty good on this pour. I spilled just a little bit in the beginning. The rest of it went right down the chute. And when there's no bronze splattering, there's no black smoke, and there's no bronze leaking out the bottom of the mold, and the bronze comes all the way to the top, you pretty you can be pretty confident you have a good pour, but you never know. Sometimes they just don't come out good, and you don't want to leave bronze in the crucible because when it hardens, when it cools, it will fill the crucible, and then when you try to reheat it, it will expand and it'll crack the crucible. So every pour you gotta dump it out, make sure it's empty, and I just pour into these little steel um, ingot molds I've made, and uh, it's no big deal. It won't stick to that cold metal and next time you want to pour you just dump this thing upside down and they fall out put them back in the crucible um, I got, got caught a little bit off guard it filled up these three and I, I didn't have another one set up so I had to act real quick get one set up clean it out and we filled it up and then while the um, crucible's hot I kind of scraped the edges a little bit try to get some of the junk off the edges it's kind of hard. It, the crucibles tend to fill as you use them and hold less and less and the sides get thicker and thicker. I'm not sure what to do about that. But anyway, we had a good pour. Everything's cleaned out. We're going to go put the crucible back in the furnace so it can cool down. And we're going to eat some lunch and uh, let this mold cool off and we'll break it open and see what we got. see how much the bronze shrinks when it cools which is why you try to make the sprue and the feeders out of something heavier cross-section than the piece and the thinner pieces always freeze first because they just don't hold as much calories of heat and then as they shrink they will pull metal from the next thickest part and that'll pull metal from the next thickest part and that will pull metal from, in this case, the cup was the last to freeze because it's the big heavy blob on top. Now, the ceramic shell does not expand or contract. It's very dimensionally stable. So as this piece shrinks, cools off, you can see the crack. 
Now that obviously that wasn't there with Ford Browns because it was a leak. But uh, it's going to start cracking and popping. And by the time it's cool enough to handle and bring outside, a lot of the shell will already have popped off. So while I'm waiting for this thing to cool down a little bit, here's a little test to know how good you did. See, this is the vent. This is a good sign. That means the metal was molten all the way up to here. So the chances of having a void anywhere are pretty slim. And one came up on the other side too. So um, looking good. We're going to bring it outside and bust it up. So the little chipping gun will dent the bronze. Um, so you got to be kind of careful when you're dealing with the face. But I uh, let Debbie chip at it for a little while and then I couldn't stand it anymore so I took the hammer from her and we got down to business. I put some U-shaped wires around the bottom of the mold while I still had a couple of dips left to go. Um, there's a lot of pressure trying to open this thing up because it's a flat surface. So you have all those square inches of flat surface with the molten bronze pushing against it. And you only have that little corner keeping it from opening up. And I've had one open up at the bottom before. So now I put these little wires, little, looks like hairpin clips. And I haven't had any problems since I started doing that. So far so good. So enough pussyfooting around, we bring out the little chipping gun and chip all the shell off the back. You can't do this on the face because it definitely puts marks, but you can uh, chip the back, clean up all the sprues and risers, and get them ready to be removed with the grinder with a cutoff wheel. And a little careful work with the chisel on the face. Got to be careful here. We don't want to put dents in it. Um, Debbie's pretty careful, more than me probably. And then into the blast cabinet where we use aluminum oxide abrasive to remove the mill scale and the um, little pieces of ceramic shell that are really tenacious. I mean, it's like porcelain stuck in these cracks. So uh, without the blasting cabinet, it'd be tough. Okay, so we did a quick bead blasting just to kind of get most of the junk off. I want to show you on the back. The back, we don't use the bead blaster. We use the chipping gun. But you can see the chipping gun dents the bronze, so definitely can't use that on a finished surface. So, everything you see in bronze here was wax. Um, first we made the wax, or my wife made the wax. First she modeled the art, and then made a mold, and then she painted wax in the mold. And then I came and I put a wax cup, a wax sprue all the way down, and some little feeders. I got one, two, four, five of them directly in, and the rest of these I have them all sloped, so my goal was to have the bronze go to the very bottom quickly before it chilled, and then start filling up the mold. And as it goes up, it'll be hotter and hotter because all this stuff will start getting hot. But uh, so far, so good. Now I gotta go along with the grinder and cut, cut all these off like I cut this one off. And these are kind of hard to get to. These are kind of hard to get to. I'll have to cut this here and maybe here to be able to even get to it. Um, I put this little blob in wax to drill and tap for a support and I'll probably drill and tap this one and this one so that'll be four like studs that they can uh, epoxy into the stone. And always needs chasing. You always got these little bitty boogers. Need to get a little chisel and clean them, chip them out, but it doesn't take too long. Then we'll put a patina on it.
you can see this hollow spot on the main sprue. Um, what happens is the artwork, um, it froze first because it's the thinnest and as it freezes it shrinks so it sucked molten bronze from that vertical little feeder and as that vertical little feeder started to freeze it started shrinking and it pulled metal from the sprue. So this is like it's supposed to work. Sometimes it works just right, sometimes it doesn't. And I'm using a needle gun to clean the shell, the ceramic shell, out of the back, all, out of all these little crevices and everything. It works pretty good, but you can't use it on a face coat because it definitely leaves an imprint. And this will be referred to as chasing the metal. Um, this pour came out pretty good. There's not that much stuff to work on, but there is a several little BBs and some little um, fins where the mold had little microscopic cracks and the bronze will run up in there so you just peck at it for a while um, Debbie's a little more meticulous than I am so when I think I'm done she usually comes behind me and spends some more time working on it so between a needle gun and the grinder with the flap disc and the grinder with the grinding disc and a hammer um, I got the back pretty flat pretty happy with it I also put it on the big belt sander kind of get it so when it sits down there's there's no gaps and on the face I've been chipping on it uh, for a while with the little bitty chisel trying to get all the little boogers off and I think I'm in pretty good shape we'll put it back in the blast cabinet and get rid of the rest of the white and the rest of this mill scale and, uh, then we'll put the wire brush on it with the grinder and then we'll start some surface work and then whatever little bad spots are left we'll take care of them at that time but it's coming along pretty good it was a good cast so this is a soft wire wheel and this is a variable speed grinder so i can turn the speed down and i'm just further cleaning uh, further cleaning and refining the, the surface of the bronze So again, we're um, cleaning and refining the, the surface. This is, I think, 320 grit, and it will remove metal, so it can't just like push down on one spot real hard because it will distort the surface. And after I do this, I have some little buffing pads that fit this little um, two-inch roll lock. And we'll buff it up and just keep cleaning and shining and chipping and, until we like the looks of it. So before we get too far along with the face, I probably should have done this earlier. I'm drilling and tapping for anchor studs. This piece is going to be mounted against a um, stone, um, a granite or a marble stone, I don't know which. So I am drilling and tapping some quarter by 20. I'm using, doing five of them. This is always a little hairy because it's hard to tell how far you can drill before you poke through the surface. So I haven't done that yet, but I'm sure I will eventually. And don't forget, this thing started out as a flat sheet of wax, so, you know, it wasn't very strong. And then you work on it, adding the sprues and the risers and the cup and all that, and it tends to deform. So, sometimes you got to straighten it back out. This silicon bronze is very ductile. It doesn't crack when you try to straighten things out. So we are basically ready for patina. Um, Debbie will come in the morning. And she'll get the hammer and chisel and she'll knock on a few little things she won't like. And then we'll put it back in the bead blasting cabinet. And that will be to clean the surface of fingerprints or anything like that. And then we will put a patina on it, which is um, basically an artificial tarnish. Get rid of this gold color and make it look more natural. So I told you a big fat lie. Right after this video was taken, the cold weather moved in. Um, we had temperature in the teens and then we lost power and it was pretty unpleasant uh, it wasn't life or death for us but it was for some people but anyway um debbie wasn't coming to work in that kind of temperature for sure so these are pictures from a long time ago on another piece and i just kind of wanted to briefly explain the patina process so if bronze was left alone for 30 or 40 or 50 years it would naturally um, oxidize tarnish and the color it would end up depends on the chemicals in the air. East Coast, West Coast, Gulf of Mexico, Europe, the same alloy may turn different colors. So to speed that process up, um, patineurs apply heat and chemicals. 
some of them pretty strong. Uh, in this case, we turn it black with birchwood casey, which is like a gun bluing compound. And then we try to buff most of that off. We just want dark in the recesses to give it some depth. And then I went over it with some strong cuprate and nitrate to get those greens and those veins. And then, now I'm guessing here because this was done a couple of years ago. And then I think we went over it with um, ferric nitrate to get the browns and the reddishes. And might have gone back and forth a couple of times. I don't really remember. And then we heat it up one more time and apply wax, which will kind of seal it and then the patina is finished now this particular piece after we patina it is going to a memorial garden in a churchyard in situate massachusetts the inscription at the top reads before you were born i knew you in the womb so it's one of our uh, popular pieces from debbie and um, that's what we do at the foundry when we're doing foundry work i hope you enjoyed this little video i know it wasn't the best quality because I wasn't really planning on filming the thing. But uh, anyway, thanks for watching.